So thank you so much guys for organizing this amazing tour in the light of the fact we all can't travel and you know we can't we can't even though we are not physically interacting this is the next best thing that you guys could have done with all these sessions and you know i started off this tour i'm you know kind of having the privilege to end this tour with the last session and i hope everybody else had a good time and did a good amount of learning from all of these sessions so my session is focused on you know troubleshooting tips and tricks for the oracle database so this is basically for dbas who are managing environments and stuff like that and they're troubleshooting day-to-day -day issues. So what I've done here is I'm trying to give you tips and tricks that will make you a little bit faster than most of your colleagues that don't attend this presentation. And the idea is that to use these tips and tricks to make yourself more efficient, show yourself better to your boss, you know, make the big bucks and get the raises and the promotions. So that's basically what this thing is, is to make the DBAs look really good and to make you efficient with some of these tips and tricks that you can use for the Oracle database. Most of these are applicable for even older versions. Some of these are for 18C and higher, but I'll mention those when I'm talking about which tips apply for the newer versions and which tips apply for the older versions. All right, so with that, we'll start off with the troubleshooting tips and tricks for the Oracle database. So first of all, uh, you know we don't, we don't recommend customers take system state dumps, but sometimes we don't have a choice and we need those to basically look at how the system is performing. So for smaller systems, sometimes when we're debugging, we take something called system state dumps. Now what system state dumps are, are they basically scan the list of processes that are running inside the database. And for each process, it dumps out something called a process state, what the process is doing, uh, what's, what's currently going on in the process, what resources it has held, uh, what is the current wait event it's on, what library cache object it's holding, what disk group it has accessed, there's a lot of information that's written in a system state. So a system state is like an X-ray of the body. So it's an X-ray of the database. So it tells you what's currently happening in the database at that particular point in time. One of the reasons why we don't tell people to take system states manually is because system states can be very intensive or extremely large systems and can sometimes cause problems when you're taking the system state itself. So this is a very selective diagnostic method lately. And it's only done when people explicitly ask for it but if your database is small, I've seen some people take system states to still troubleshoot what's going on in their DB. The first tip here is to basically look at system states and basically how to read them. So like I told you, system states are made up of process states and process states are basically all the processes in the database that are currently active. Now each process state is represented by something called a state object. A state object holds details of everything that's currently held by that process. What, what, uh, resource, what cursors, what weight event it's currently there, what NQs it's currently holding, all of that stuff is there. So if you want to navigate this, you have to find out what processes the most sessions are waiting for, and then you can navigate each of these processes and you find a chain to find out what the particular process that you're interested in is stuck on and why it is stuck. So this is what you do for debugging system states. We'll go through one example to just give you an idea of how to look at some of these system states. So first thing is, I have a process here that's basically waiting for a TXNQ. So that's indicated by wait for TXNQ uh, row cache contention. And uh, you can see that wait event here. So the first thing is this is the session ID, sequence number, how long it's been waiting. So this is second since wait. And then uh, there's a name and mode. And then the USN basically indicates the, the unknown segment number. The name and mode combination is basically ASCII 5658, and then you convert this, it's 0006. So this is T and this is X. So this is basically, you know, this is TX, and this is how you translate the name and the mode. And this is being held in 0006, which is basically in exclusive mode. So the request is for exclusive mode, and it's currently waiting for it. But what, why is it waiting for? So you continue into the process state, you start searching next, is for this request string, right? The request string as to what this thing is reading on for requesting. So you look for request equal to X for this particular TX resource that you're currently waiting on. And once you find the request equal to X, you found the process that is currently holding this thing. And then you find out what mode the process that is holding is waiting on. It's what it's waiting on, in, it's holding something in exclusive mode, which in this case is the, the holder. And then you can see that this is for the same TX resource. And this is incompatible, obviously, to the request that you have here for exclusive mode. So this guy is waiting on this guy 
for an exclusive mode TXNQ request. So let's go to the next step to see what's going on here. You go to the process that's currently holding the TXNQ. And then you see here that this process itself is waiting for row cache lock. Row cache lock, it's waiting for mode equal to zero, request equal to three. Mode equal to zero means it's not currently holding the lock. Request equal to three means it's requesting the lock in shared mode. The same object here, this is the same object that it's basically working on. It's requesting the lock on this object and it's shared. And the row cache parent object is DC underscore users. So a TX lock is waiting on somebody else that's holding the lock in exclusive mode. That exclusive mode guy is waiting on a row cache lock, waiting for something on a row cache object parent for CID equal to seven, which is basically DC users. So now we're wondering why is this guy waiting for row cache mode? So who's holding the row cache lock request? Go to the next step. In the next step, we find this combination and we look for the person that's basically searching for this object. And then you find somebody that's basically holding this object. How do you know this person is holding this object? Because this one says mode equal to X. And here it says request equal to X. That way you're searching for this object ID and you find the process that's basically holding on to this particular object ID. And again, this is for DC users. And this is the portion of the process state that shows that this particular object so state object number, this also will be reflected somewhere here when you look in the process. That's how you map it between the process. So this guy is holding the row cache lock in exclusive mode. Let's go to the next step. What this session is waiting on is they're waiting on cursor pin S wait on X. And then if you look at further in the system state, it's waiting on a mutex. 3094 here is basically the state of the process that's holding this. And the request is for basically getting it in shared mode. So this process that the row cache guy is waiting on is waiting on a cursor S pin weight on X, which is basically a library cache mutex weight. And this guy is waiting and is, is basically from SID 3094 and is trying to get this in shared mode. Let's go to the next level. This person is the holder for this and this person is basically holding it in exclusive mode. And then we've, we got to find out, we got to search for this combination to find out who's basically holding this thing in exclusive mode. In this case, the SID 3094 is also holding the mutex in exclusive mode. The number one thing, mutexes are like serialization mechanisms to allow people for creating cursors or child cursors for the same object as a result of which you can basically share multiple cursors for the same object. So we go to the next level and you find the process is waiting on library cache lock. So row cache lock waiting on cursor pin S wait on X waiting on library cache lock that's holding this address. Then you search for this address, you find the next object in the chain. You see how complicated this is, but the idea is to show you how you can debug through this chain. So you're looking at this, this person is requesting an exclusive for this handle and for a particular object. This is the object that we're trying to lock. Finally, when you search for this, you come to a process that is waiting for latch free. That's the final one. The latch is 9D. And then you go look for this guy that's waiting, is waiting on a child library cache latch. Page 127, OS 23086. And then you find out the person that's basically executing this query is a select user from dual. And this person is the holder of this entire chain. You end the session, all of the connections above basically finish. So what this tip I've done with is I've gone through a system state. I mentioned things like state objects. I've shown you how to search across and what these various values mean. What is namespace equal to cursor? How do you look at this? What is a handle? which handle, what do you search to go from one process to another process? So this helps you read some of the Oracle trace files when you're debugging some of this hang kind of a situation. Now, this is an extreme way of debugging some of this, but I've also seen there are easier ways. There's actually a view called V$ weight underscore chains. So V$ weight underscore chains is another way to do this. 
uh, that actually gives you a global view. Give me a second. I don't know what's going on here. Oh, okay. So V dollar weight underscore chains is a way for uh, you to look at sessions that are across a rack cluster and you get to see who's holding what. And it's a more easier way of looking at this. But in case you are debugging something and you're debugging something that uh, requires you to look at a system state, this is the tip. Sorry, my computer is like flashing on and off. I don't know what happened, but uh, I think my stream is still intact and you can still see my screen. All right, so let me, let me go back to this. Tip number two, ADDM in a multi-tenant environment. So by default, you know, everybody knows what Adam is. It basically allows you to generate performance-based recommendations for a database. You can use Adam in a pluggable database also, but typically it works on the level of a CDB. This is starting 12 onwards. So Adam analysis is performed for each snapshot taken on a CDB or a PDB, but by default, because the automatic AWR snapshots in 12 are disabled for ADDM, it does not work on a PDB level by default. So what you have to do is you have to set uh, AWR PDB auto flush enabled equal to true, and then execute your DBMS workload repository modify snapshot settings to specify the interval to be 60, which means, which means once an hour take a snapshot. By doing these two steps, it enables ADDM to basically do this on a PDB level. So this is how you do from 12 uh, on, the, on release 12 upwards, how do you enable ADDM in a PDB? In the newer versions from 19 onwards, this is already done by default, but people who want to take advantage of this in the older releases like 18 and 12 can basically do this, is to enable uh, setting AWR PDB auto flush enable decoder true. And then by modifying the snapshot settings, you can basically do things on a PDB level. Uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section. I will address some of these in the last five minutes of the session. How do you analyze logs? This is something that most DBAs do. And normally I've seen people, you know, go from opening up multiple windows or uploading the logs into some central location and running a parser and doing all sorts of things. Uh, there's a couple of mechanisms we have. One of them is new, one of them is old. We'll talk about the older mechanism here. And then I'll mention something about a newer command that's actually coming that'll, that'll make this thing even more powerful as compared to what it is for now. You can basically say TFACTL analyze minus since one day. And this will basically combine all the alert logs and all the Unix system logs and show you the most interesting events that are basically happening in a histogram perspective. Now, what's a histogram perspective? Imagine this, I have an alert log that's 2 GB in size, but I have all sorts of um, repeated error messages of the same kind. I don't wanna look at the whole 2 GB log. I just want a quick summary of what's in this log. Are there exceptions? Are they just log switches? Are they startups? Are they shutdowns? I need a concise summary of what's in this log. Maybe there's like 20 unique kinds of log messages. And this is what helps me by giving me a, a histogram of this entire thing without having to go through the entire log. So by default, it scans everything and it gives me a summary histogram by showing me how many times a particular log line has occurred from which server it has come from and what percentage of the total log is that forming. And you can see the occurrences and the percentage will correlate. So this is how you analyze everything for the last one day across all your alert logs, across all your homes and your system logs. If you wanna search for a 4031 exception for the last one day across these logs, you can basically run this command. If you, this, there's a whole host of different kinds of commands you can run. Um, Analyze log, yeah. Uh, I think slides are cut, it looks like, uh... It looks like it's cut it from the right and from the bottom. People can't see the whole slide. Do you want me to get out of slide mode? Maybe. I don't know. Hang on. Uh, people can is see. This, is this better? Yeah, it looks like now 
it looks like it's cut it from the right. Okay. Hang on, let me let me stop sharing and start sharing again. All right, give me one second. Let's go with. Yeah, now, now it's better. Now I'm going to go back to full screen. Can you see this? Yeah, now it's, it's correct. Now it's, now it's good. Okay. I, I don't know what happened. Sorry about this. No problem. No problem. All right. So I'm going to go back to this. So one thing is, whatever I'm mentioning here, you'll get all this stuff in the slides. So I'm sorry if you've missed something in the last couple of minutes, but the commands and their outputs are all in the slides. That's why I kind of made the slides this way. That way, if I don't have time to cover something in details, uh, you can actually look at the slides and it'll give you enough of an idea of what to do. Uh, the first one, again, I told you was TFACT and analyze minus since five hours. Uh, that basically gives you the capability to uh, scan logs for five hours and give you a summary. You want to only go through the var log messages. You can specify minus comp OS. If you want to search for an aura string, you can specify minus search aura. If you want to analyze, uh, and look for a string which says starting Oracle database something. You can say, you can do uh, the starting slash C uh, since two days. And this is basically case sensitive, case sensitive string. And it's gonna look for the same thing for the last two days. Uh, same thing for analyzing log messages from one time or for a specific time. And also there's a component called OS Watcher. Normally what people do is they, and I'll talk about OS Watcher a little bit later in my presentation I have, more details on this, but this is basically a tool that allows people to analyze OS Watcher output instead of looking at the actual log files. You know, people just can run analyze comp OS W minus and six hours and shows you the top summary for the last six hours analyzed without having to go through the individual log files themselves. So this is all about automatically parsing information and trying to come up with quick recommendations on what to do. One thing that's been very common that's been causing a lot of problems off lately is the slab information. Slab information is basically kernel memory that is utilized for different components. And sometimes what happens is because of a bug in the kernel or because of a bug in some other components, uh, there's a lot of slab memory that's consumed that results in the, in the panic, results in an oops, the kernel reboots the machine. In order to track the slab and who's basically consuming a certain amount of information or memory from the slab, you can run the analyze comp slab information, OS, OS watcher slab information. And that will tell you the slab information summary for that particular time period. And you can also see which component is increasing its consumption over that time period. So that's another very good way of tracking kernel slab information. So these are, these are some of the commands. Uh, these are some of the outputs. So when I analyze this, it shows you the, I told you it shows you the histogram based way. These are the log lines. Uh, these are, these are the log lines here. Uh, these are the percentage. So this line is basically 47% of this log and it's about 1500 occurrences. So I don't have to look at the whole log. This is basically like a log of 3000 lines summarized in one page. So it's really fast. And for me, if I want to quickly kind of find out what's happening in my alert log. I don't have to look at the whole log. I can just look at this. Same thing for searching. This is what the analysis for the OS Watcher component looks like. And if you look at this, there's basically all of these stats and there's the first, the highest and the lowest. And then the average and the trend. The trend basically tells you, is this going higher? Is this going lower? So I can see the idle has gone down a little bit. Number of users are up by 20%. This is over six hours. Now, what are these timings? For the highest value, it even tracks the timings when the values were highest. For the lowest value, it tracks the timing when the value was lowest. So this is, of course, if you're giving it a six hour period, if you exceed a day, then you don't get some of these, but it's really powerful by just looking at this, it shows me when my utilization was high, what was the, the first, the highest, the last, the second last and the third last values and how many number of non-zero samples are there in this entire number. So it's actually pretty powerful in terms of what I can do with this. 
So by the way, I think my, my display is kind of like fluctuating from time to time. So if you, if I think when it goes off and on, sometimes my screen might shrink. I can't make out here because it's no difference to me at this point. But if, in case you're having problems in the, in the Zoom, uh, you can just please let me know. Okay. I don't know what's going on here. Hang on. Let me go back to screen sharing. Sorry, this thing has just started today morning. I don't know, maybe it was a new update I installed. Can you see the screen cut off or can you see it normal? Normal. Normal, right? Okay, cool. So pardon these interruptions. I don't know what's happening with my machine here. So uh, the same thing with slab information. So you can see all the different kinds of slabs here. And then you can see the, the total uh, time and the average consumption and the third and the second and the last and the trend in terms of like who's consuming the most amount within this time period and which one's increasing significantly. So this is very useful when you're debugging slab information. Now this one is actually very interesting because a lot of DBAs land up running into this. My database is hung, how do I collect diagnostics? There's something called a SQL plus preliminary connection. The SQL plus preliminary connection allows you to connect to your database. It has limited access to the SGA, but at the same time, it helps in capturing any kind of diagnostic information. Remember what I told you about system state dumps. Please do not do this on your own. Do it only under the instructions of Oracle support if you have to, but it allows you to get in and allows you to find like run queries from read all weight chains and a couple of these views to find out what's really hanging inside your database. It tries not to access the library cache because then it could actually get stuck like other SQLs. So SQL plus minus prelim slash assist DBA allows you to establish a prelim connection and a prelim connection will connect to the DB for diagnostic purposes. And this is how you debug your database when a SQL plus slash assist DBA basically is not connected to the database. This is the only way to access the database for diagnostic reasons. If you want to shut it down, if you want to kill a process, this is, and you want to know what process to kill, this is a way to do it. So this is called a SQL plus preliminary connection. Then you have a hung database. What are the various tools available for you to look at a hung database? So first of all, uh, starting something like Levin, we have this thing, it's called Hang Manager. Every subsequent version has actually refined this particular feature, but sometimes people don't know what this is and how it works. So first of all, it's always on. This, and Hang Manager is, is mainly in rack environments. So this may not be in single instance environments. It's, it, it, was, it was ported to single instance environments until very recently, but mostly it's in rack environments. Its goal is to detect database hangs and deadlocks and autonomously resolve them for most of these things. And it detects and logs all of these resolutions. And there's also a SQL based interface to basically configure sensitivity, whether it is normal, high, as well as trace file sizes. How does this basically work? And what are the new features that are present in this? It monitors session snapshots for progress. Now, one thing that's always been an annoyance, and this has been uh, as long as uh, I have worked on some of this stuff, where it's like, I'm trying to debug a database issue, but I look like something is stuck in ASM. And I don't know what is stuck in ASM. And I'm trying to figure this out but I have to go to ASM and run a query and I have to go to database and run a query. What this thing does is it basically transcends from database to ASM and it detects blockers that even go from database to ASM. And when you look at the logs themselves, there's actually a section here and it's a process here called dia zero that basically is responsible for all of this. And it says possible hangs detected. This requested a global termination of SID foo with serial hash bar, which is basically OS paid. And it says it's a global high confidence hang, which means it's pretty sure that this guy, OS paid 13031 with SID 40 and session ID 43179 is basically affecting a large number of sessions. And then you finally see the resolution here where it's basically performed automated hang resolution by terminating this particular session. So not only is this thing responsible for detecting hangs, it is also responsible for killing it. I remember earlier in the earlier days when we used to work on rack, there'd be a lot of people that would hold the control file in queue and the database would basically lock up. 
This kills everything that basically holds onto the control file NQ for too long, as long as it's not a fatal background process. It's the fatal background processes are well behaved and they don't hold on to the control file NQ for too long. But anything else that is holding on to the control file NQ that can be killed and there's not a fatal background process can actually be killed. And this hang manager utility does it. So a lot of stuff is DBAs. This gets taken care of. You don't have to bother about it, but this is how you debug it. You have to look at the dia zero traces. Dia zero is the process that basically does automated hang resolution. And that's how you debug this. A lot of people don't know about this, but this is like guided resolution with Oracle support. So your first instinct when you have a problem is to basically open up an SR. That should not be the first instinct. There's this thing called a troubleshooting assistant. And I've put a couple of screens but the idea here is to basically show you the, you, you can track the doc IDs and then you can see the user interface kind of gives you an idea of what this is. What, this, what the goal of this assistant is, <clears throat> is to guide you through possible solutions for problems where you don't need to open up an SR, but you can do it yourself. So I can pick the kind of problem. I'm having a global NQ services deadlock issue. I'm having an or 600 or I'm having a locked up database I'm not able to get in. I can select the kind of problem I have. Now, in this case, I said I have a global NQ deadlock. There's, it points me to a note what I can use. If I do a database startup issue <clears throat> and I pick, hey, I'm not able to, you know, I've got some database startup issue. The moment I pick a database startup issue, it tells me what is the phase in which you're having a problem. And then I say, yep, my startup is slow or hung. Then it tells me, what phase are you at right now? And I say, I'm at the mount phase. And then it tells me, here's a note that tells you what you can use to fix this. Otherwise, here's how you can supply the information and open up a service request. So it gives you what to do. In many cases, it gives you automated solutions for what you can do to resolve this particular thing. So this is, this is actually present for many different areas of the database. I showed you one for hangs. I showed you one for startups. This one's for automated undo management. Uh, same thing, you select the undo retention, then you specify how do you configure the undo table space optimally, and it points you to nodes of how to do this. Same thing here for hangs and corruptions. I can specify, hey, I have a corruption. I have a cluster corruption. Then it tells me run this query and find out what tables did the cluster contain. And then it tells me if this owner assists, then you have to contact Oracle support. It requires recovery. If it's not, then you can salvage all the tables in the cluster and then recreate this cluster. So you notice what this does is it actually gives you a way to navigate through a problem without having to raise a service request and doing some of these things on your own. Support is working on more and more automation like this so that you can do things automatically quickly without actually having to raise a service request. SQL health check, this is a really old one. I mean, but it's like people sometimes still don't know about this or don't know how to use this. What this is, is basically like a SQL health uh, tuning script and it does a couple of things. First of all, it's free. When you connect to the database, you basically say start this and you specify the ID of the SQL. But you also need, you'll need to specify whether you have the tuning diagnostic pack or you have none of them. When you specify this, it accordingly realizes whether you have the licenses and it uses the appropriate underneath views or not. Once you specify the SQL, it basically goes through and gives you the base statistics, suggestions for improvements, categories, and a whole bunch of recommendations on what you can actually do to improve the SQL. It's a very simple tool. It kind of works and people look at it and they, they use it to tune most of their situations with some level of automation. Of course, there's a lot of tools that Oracle has. There's, there's from stored outlines to uh, you know, tr uh, adaptive baselines to you know, uh, push down predicates with uh, bind graduation and bind peaking. There's so many features inside the Oracle database that allow you to do performance optimization. And there are so many ways, including test case filter, how you can package some of this and ship it to Oracle. But this is one more tool that allows you to look at SQLs 
and figure out what you can do for the SQL and how you can optimize this thing using the SQL. The next one is how do you query trace files using SQL? So this has been present for some time, but a lot of people don't know about this and people who do not have access to the OS can actually query this. So there are two views. There's V$ Diag trace file and V$ Diag trace file content. And this gives you information like the ADR home, the trace file name and when it was modified and all that. And this is the container ID from which it comes from. So what, what, is, the, what is the use of having uh, this kind of interface? Hang on, what's going on? My Zoom is just... Can you guys see this? I don't know, my Zoom is just hung up on me. Hmm. Hang on. I'm not able to move anything here. All right, what's going on? Are you guys still able to hear me? Yes, we can hear. Okay, I'm not able to move my screen. I think this thing has completely locked up. Maybe this is the Zoom issue you guys were talking about before. All right, hang on. I gotta figure out a way to kill this thing and restart my... Hmm, this has not happened before. I don't know what's going on here. Stop sharing. I don't know, it's not able to respond to the screen here. Hmm. Is this the same problem you guys spoke about the other day? I don't know what's going on. I never, this has never happened when I presented before. Hang on, let me just kill. Maybe Zoom reached the uh, limits. I don't know. Well, see, I'm not able to see a couple of screens. Hang on. Zoom. No, I'm not able to see. Uh, you know, my display turned off and I can't see the Zoom meeting either. Hang on. Back to meeting. Okay, hang on. I think at least I'm getting control of my machine back. Uh, my, my screen went into some kind of a hang state and uh, I'll probably be back in a minute. Just give me a second. So I killed I killed the sharing session and I killed my PowerPoint and I'm trying to restart the share again. Hmm, this is weird because this is I've not had I've not had this problem before. All right, hang on. So go with this. Go back to my meeting. And then we can this back. Yeah, see, the problem is I'm not able to see the slides either because my screens are frozen and it's not letting me leave. But I think I've. 
figure this out. So give me one second, I'm almost ready there. And PowerPoint. All right, can you guys see this? Yes. All right, okay, let's continue. So you can go, sorry about that. I don't know what happened, but it was not letting me, uh, it wasn't letting me go ahead on my PowerPoint and I had to kill the whole thing and restart this back. So we don't have diet trace file, we don't have diet trace file content. So these are two views that you can basically query for this. Uh, select trace file name from read all or die trace file allows you to query and you can see all the trace files that are present on your system. Uh, you can look at the content of the file. If you know the name of the file, you can just say select payload from read all or die trace file content and it shows you paginated what the content of the trace file is. Uh, there's another one called read all or die trace says SQL trace records. What this does is it basically allows you to query uh, like a 10046 uh, session. So when you do a select SID comma serial from read all session, you, once you have the SID and serial, for example, I'm doing a performance tuning uh, kind of an exercise and I execute DBMS system set SQL trace and session and I specify the SID and the serial number and I say true, this enables a SQL tracing or a 10046 tracing in the particular uh, log file. I can find out unique trace file name from this. And it basically gives me that trace file. So it tells me that's the log in which the tracing is currently enabled. And I can do a select payload from that V$ diaccess SQL trace records where trace file name equal to something. And I can actually see the content of the cursor that's currently being traced from a performance tuning perspective. So here's a good way to do SQL tuning, not leave the SQL prompt and simultaneously debug your session that you're currently working on. So you you've turned on SQL tracing for another session and you're debugging another session using SQL and you're looking at the 10046 trace output in that particular SQL. So this is, the, and then you finish turning off the SQL trace in the other session when you're complete. So here's a way of how you can basically do debugging using the V$ views without actually having to go to the OS and doing VI on the log files themselves. Uh, I think we're almost out of time. So I'll do this last, uh, tip, and then we'll kind of switch to Q&A. So by the way, I'm only halfway through my presentation. I have a lot of tips. I just kept thinking how I can go as long as I can. I'm going to upload this entire presentation. So it has a lot more content in terms of what other things you can troubleshoot. And you can view this once I've finished uploading this. One thing that people, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Sandesh, it's your last session. If you have time and people want to stay another 10 minutes, okay. it's okay for us. It's okay. up Sweet. to you. Okay, I mean, I wanted to give some time for Q&A also. Yes, so of it's course. Like, so what, I, what I do is- Mention oh, that see, okay. you, you are not um, having, your session does so not- So I have no time constraints. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when you're doing pre and post patching, you know, one of the most common problems I've seen that people have is the Oracle home permissions get messed up. now. Typically what happens is two weeks after the patching, something goes wrong and people are like, hey, it's your fault. You patched the database, something went wrong and you didn't do anything about it. Now, as a DBA, you have no idea what the Oracle home looked like at that point. You don't even know if this was the fault of the previous DBA who did something and left and you inherited that home and you patched it correctly, but the permission on some file was not right at the beginning. So what you do is, there's an option in, or in OraCheck that you can execute file attributes and you say start and you say include this particular div. Or you can basically just give this command. And any and every home that's there will all their file attributes, a snapshot will be taken of those file attributes. So once that happens, then you can check after you finish the patching exercise for the same file attributes, except you change this to a check. And this will tell you the baseline and the current as to what has changed. So in this case, I've seen some file that was owned by Oracle is now owned by root. So it basically creates a snapshot of all the attributes of all the files, ownerships, with permissions and stores it. And when you finish your exercise, you run it again and whatever output that comes from this exercise, you should store this file somewhere so that 
three months later, something goes wrong and they're like, hey, wait, this file was never supposed to have this particular permission. You can go back and see whether it was done because of the patching or whether it was like that before the patching, it was none of your fault and somebody else who installed it did not do the right job. So it creates a change tracking system for all changes in your environment. So that's pretty cool. So this is, this is how do you track for any kind of major maintenance you do on your Oracle homes, you can track the file attributes and you can store this information. And the report produces a nice difference and you store the snapshot report for the future along with a patch directory to say, if anytime I'm being questioned, I know exactly what I did. Event notifications. For people that use OraCheck or ExaCheck for proactively running on their systems and to verify that the systems are compliant without actually having to go and do this manually, you can also configure notifications. So what happens is you get reports along with diff reports in your email in the morning. And if there's no diff, then you know that the system is the same as what it was yesterday. And you can just ignore that report. You don't have to look at the entire report. This is how you can be on top of all your systems without actually having to go check if each system is compliant with best practices or anything in your system has currently regressed. So you set this for your notification and then the system basically configures, you have to configure SMTP and a, forward, a forwarding email from these servers. And then once you specify the address, it can basically send you notifications when faults are detected, when reports are generated through aura check, and you'll basically get these exceptions in your mail. So you could be heading in a, in a train, heading to your office, or now it's like you're just gonna be waking up in the morning and suddenly you see your notifications and you're like, yep, I know, I know, I know. And the boss comes and tells you, hey, there's a serious problem on this system. You know, can you help look at this? And you're like, yep, I already knew about it because I already saw it. And it's like, your boss will wonder, you haven't even started working and how come you already know about it? So these are smarter ways of getting notifications on your system, possibly getting solutions, as well as looking at faults uh, from a best practices perspective on your systems and anything that is not compliant. So remember this, it's all about driving more automation. Another thing is a lot of DBAs get OR 600s and they're like, the first thing to do is to look up the OR 600 and get a genetic note about it. And people are like, this doesn't help me. So what you do is there's this thing, it's called the OR 600 troubleshooting tool, okay? So what do you do is you troubleshoot a new issue and then it'll ask you to upload either a TFA package or an IPS package or the corresponding trace file. The recommended approach is a TFA package because you don't have to worry about what to upload. You go to the server and you run this TFA CTL die collect or 600 and it shows you all the or 600s you have in your server with a reasonable like the last 20 or the last couple of hours. You pick the number of the or 600 you want and it generates a zip file. It compresses everything. It removes all the data that is not applicable to that particular time frame, and it generates a zip file. You take this zip file and you upload it to the site where it said upload the zip file, the previous screen that I showed you. And then it immediately goes into a, a note that describes that specific OR600 and what that OR600 represents, as well as all the known issues with that OR600 and versions that are affected as well as patches and all that sort of information. So this is a really cool way for you to just run an SRDC. I'll go back to the screen here and show you the command again. Die collect SRDC or 600. You pick the SRDC that you pick the or 600 you're interested in. You upload this zip file to my Oracle support. This is not logging an SR. This is using this or 600 troubleshooting tool. Okay. And then once you upload this, zip file, it's going to show you all the information about this OR600 without you having to guess, what am I going to search for, for this OR600? It's a very cool way to, to quickly do self-service and you can find out more about this error without having to specify which log file should I give, what should I search on MOS, none of that, just upload a zip, get all the information. That's just the way this works. Uh, I will stop at this last one. Uh, this is for AWR scripts. Now, this is something that everybody knows, but I found many times when I'm working with customers, people sometimes don't know which is the right scripts to execute. So this is a very basic generic tip. For AWR, everybody knows what a system model is. 
And we also collect object statistics that determine the access of database segments. So this is basically you collect AWR, you collect ASH, we all assist that, we all assist that, and we all assist type model. Great, everybody knows about this one. The most common commands people know is this. You create a snapshot, you create a snapshot again, you run AWR RPT, you collect your stuff, and you're done. This is what 99% of the people do. But there are specialized AWR scripts that are created, which are not meant for, which are meant for specific scenarios, which people don't use. They use only this one. And this one is only meant for a very, very generic scenario. And what are these other scripts? The first one is basically AWR DDRPT. This is for generating a report and comparing time periods in the database. So if I wanna compare nine o'clock to 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock to 1, 1, uh, to 1 p.m., I wanna compare those two time periods, I can do AWR DDRPT. If I have a specific database instance, DDRPI, if I want to compare the AWR reports for rack, now this is something that people never do. I have no ideas why you have to run AWR G DRPT dot SQL to compare AWR reports on a rack instance. Okay. And if you want to generate an AWR report for rack, you need to run AWR G RPT. People do not run the G, they run only the AWR RPT and they get the data from the local instance. In a rack environment, you need to have the global picture if you're troubleshooting anything for a performance issue. You need to run AWR grpt.sql every time you're doing an AWR for a rack environment. Same thing for uh, if you want to compare AWR for rack for a specific instance and it's global. So you gotta remember the G and you gotta remember this. So this is to compare reports on rack this is to compare reports on a specific instance where you are running on a different instance as compared to the instance that you want to generate the report on. If you want to generate the report for the entire rack environment, it's AWR GRPT, not AWR RPT. And if you want to generate a SQL statement report, it is AWR SQRPT that gives you a full SQL report. And AWR info shows you how much your AWR is consuming, what is it projected to consume in the next couple of these things so you can, uh, you can size your sysocs table space. Most of these commands are known, but people never use them because they don't know about this. Uh, you know, so anyone, anytime someone comes and tells you, hey, I had a SQL that was working perfectly yesterday evening, today morning, I don't know what's happening. The first thing you do is go to this one if you're running a single instance environment and go to this one if you're running a rack environment. That's the first SQL. You should not run AWR RPT and then start looking and guessing what's wrong. For, that's the first thing people do. Oh, what's the wait event? Oh yeah, show me that. No, AWR DD RPT, compare the two because the guy said to you that that one was the bad time and this was, was the good time. You have a comparison baseline. If you have a comparison baseline, start with a comparison baseline. Anyways, I had a lot more, but I think I'm going to end this session here and I'm going to take a couple of questions. And let me just... I'm going to stop sharing. All right. So let's let's go into uh, some of the Q and A here. All right. This ADDM parameter needs to be set at the PDB level. Yes. How do you configure TFACTL? You don't have to. It's already configured. So by default, there's something called the Autonomous Health Framework or AHF that is installed on your system. When you install single instance or rack, this is already configured. Now, you what you could do is for the older versions. Now, this is, I'm sure we are not all running 19C or you know the latest version, right? So for even for older versions before AHF was there, TFA and Exacheck and Oracheck are already configured on your system. So when you go run TFA CTL, it's already configured, it's already set up, it already knows the events. So whatever, whatever commands I've mentioned in this presentation, they can be run in your environment with no configuration required. You have to run them exactly the way I've given you in the presentation and you'll start seeing results for your systems. Do remember this, 
that TFA requires some time to collect all this data. So if you're running these commands on a newly installed system, like I installed something today morning, wait for at least a couple of hours for TFA to scan all the logs and build all this information so that it starts working. If you already have a functioning system and it's been running for some time, TFA is already configured. How do you how to implement HA similar to RAC using Oracle 19C SE2 edition? Since Oracle has deprecated the RAC feature from 19C from SE2, any suggestions, please? So the SE2 option provides the same kind of high availability. Uh, of course, it's not RAC, but it provides uh, high availability. And there's a there's actually a uh, this is more properly addressed by looking at a presentation from Anil Nair and Marcus Mikalevitz. They have actually spoken about this in detail as to how to basically use or migrate your applications to 19C SE2. It's, the scope is too much to talk about in the context of just a single question. So uh, you, could, you could follow their best practices uh, when, when trying to uh, migrate. So one thing always remember is earlier you had RAC, now you basically have SE2. SE2 is a highly available option that allows you to migrate sessions from one system to another system, but it's not RAC. It's not simultaneous concurrent connections. Uh, from uh, both the both the nodes. So for that, you have to have enterprise rack like what you had before for SE. Uh, all right, let's see. What else do I have here? Do you have a tip on translating the TIM value in the trace files? For example, comparing two TIM values. I'm sorry, I don't know the context of this. Uh, maybe, maybe you could reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn and give me an example. I might be able to explain this to you uh, better. Uh, so I, I, I know what TIM values are, but I don't know what you're trying to ask. So if you can just reach out to me and uh, uh, send me more details, I'll be happy to answer this. Um, maybe SQL developer needs to have an option to run the AWRG if possible. Yeah, that's probably not a bad tip. See, SQL developer is a developer related resource for doing things and now DBA sometimes tend to use it. Uh, it is rack aware. It does run these kind of queries, but you can you can obviously force it to run AWS. So there's a there's a standard SQL user interface where you can basically run anything. So you can basically run AWR GRPT directly through SQL Developer today. Uh, you don't need an option. You don't need you don't need a button to basically tell you, hey, I'm going to click and do this. It's a good enhancement, but you can do it using other methods today. All right, let's see. Can we have the AWR report at the PDD level? Yes. So the same enhancement that I mentioned for ADD and works for AWR as well. As a matter of fact, what commands you're running uh, enables AWR at a PDB level, that, which is what actually enables ADDM at a PDB level as well. AHF includes TFA, CTL, ExaCheck, et cetera. Yes, that is correct. AHF is a stack. TFA is a utility, ExaCheck is a utility. So AHF includes TFA, ExaCheck, or check, OS Watcher, uh, or a top, a couple of other commands. Uh, if you if you go do a, a TFA CTL tool status, it's one word, tool status. It'll show you all the tools that are installed, which ones are deployed, and uh, you can see which ones are running. So by default, like for example, OS Watcher is running on some systems. On uh, on a Exadata system, you have Exa Watcher that's basically running. So uh, AHF is a, is a mechanism that does a couple of things. It allows you to deploy all the tools, allows you to upgrade all the tools, allows you to do log management of all the tools. So you don't have to bother about TFA's logs, ExaCheck's logs. AHF takes care of all of this stuff. So you don't have to worry about the individual tools and maintenance and patching of any of these tools. When you get the latest version of AHF, it upgrades your entire tool stack. That's what AHF is for. It's a single cohesive mechanism to upgrade your tools so that you don't have to do individual things as DBAs. I just get the latest version of AHF, all the tools are upgraded to the latest version, all the latest libraries, and the commands stay the same, whether I have 12C or whether I have 20C, the command stays the same, it functions the same, even though the locations of where these log files are, are different, the locations of the homes are different, the formats of the log files might have changed, the number of log files might have changed, the number of processes might have changed, but the commands for all of these AHF related tools remain the same. All right, I have a couple of more questions. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll take another two, three questions and, and then we can probably call it a day. Um, 
AWR reports run at the CDB level. How do you know which PDB is creating the most load? It does specify, there is a PDB specific section that shows you that which PDB is actually generating what kind of workload. There are different ways of actually measuring workload. Uh, you can see which one generates the most amount of physical or logical activity. You can see which one has most undo segment activity. There are so many ways to look at this and look at the weight events themselves. But like I'd mentioned, you can run AWR at the PDB levels themselves also. So looking at the CDB level will give you a lot of noise. If you know the specific PDB that's causing a problem, it's best to run it at the PDB level. Can you use OS Watcher in single instance or only on rack? OS Watcher works on single instance or rack. It is independent of the environment. And as a matter of fact, when we deploy it, it basically works on both. OS Watcher is just a bunch of scripts that basically runs IOSTAT, VMSTAT, MPSTAT, and it collects things and takes regular snapshots and stores them on a disk. And then there's this thing called OSWG, which is basically like a OS Watcher grapher, which basically goes through all this information, generates an analysis report, and it also gives you the ability to generate graphs out of all of these things. So if you have, if you're running this on a on a Unix system and you can just export your your X uh, screen to another machine, you can export and you can pop up graphs and all that using X windows. So Voice Watcher has all of these capabilities. It runs on any system. It is not dependent on single instance or rack and can be deployed anywhere. Uh, would it be possible after checking the attribute to have it attribute to have the script to change it so that we can have a gold image and keep syncing it without fear? Yes, that's the whole idea. See, the thing is for people that have gold images, okay, attributes are not that much of a problem. Gold images are the best way to do this is never apply an OPatch on an individual machine unless you really have to, unless it's an emergency that you, know, you don't have time to roll out a new gold image. The best thing to do is always swap out the old image, down, install the new image. But of course, you have to always remember if your gold image includes a bunch of fixes, the most common mistake people make is they deploy the gold image and they forget to run the data patch portion of the patch. That is the biggest thing that people do not do. Um, I'm not sharing anything, by the way. So people are saying that there's no presentation. This is just a Q&A, so I'm just talking, answering all the Q&A uh, questions. I'm sorry, so uh, the attributes are a problem if you don't have a gold image, significantly. If you have a gold image, uh, people deploy the gold image, the attributes are not so much of a problem. People forget to run the data patch after they deploy the gold image. That results in an inconsistency between the code on the, uh, on the uh, image and the actual dictionary objects that are present inside. That's resulted in a lot of problems that I have seen at customer sites where they forget. So always remember this, put this as part of your process. If you're using gold images, okay? Or if you're using uh, the Oracle-based mechanisms for storing gold images and all these, you ensure you run data patch. So most of the stuff for, uh, for when, if you use our tools, we, we automatically run the data patch components. But if you're using your own methods of um, you know, of uh, gold image compliance, ensure you run data patch after you do this. The attributes, nonetheless, it's a good process to have and just store so that whenever something goes wrong, you have the data to actually back up what happened. Otherwise, you're just guessing what the original values were and what the patching does. Do we have a standard script to perform housekeeping of all Oracle ASM rack logs? Yes, so it's actually, I had, I had something in my, uh, in my presentation, uh, which, which talks about uh, something called managed logs. Just give me one second. Let me just share my presentation back again. So this one, hang on, let me see if I can find this. Compliance script. This one. If you want to manage your logs, what you need to do is, so first of all, database logs can be purged automatically. Okay, you can set an age and you can set the purging. At the same time, you can also do all sorts of interesting things here. You can show the usage of the consumption across GI and database logs. Now say yesterday your log destination was empty and suddenly today it's full. I can say show variation older than one day. It shows you which home has suddenly increased its consumption. You can purge the AD, purge using the ADR older than some 30 days. This will purge everything from every home on every node. This is a single global command. It'll run delete every log file from every host and every node older than a certain time. 
It's a very powerful command, so people are terrified of it. So you can use the minus dry run option here, and the minus dry run option will basically tell you what it's going to do and how much space it's going to free uh, before it actually frees and runs the actual command itself. So these are, these are a couple of the commands you can do. So show usage shows you the usage of the logs uh, across the various homes and how much consumption is there. Uh, show variation shows you that this home had this and this is the change and shows you the largest changing files. Like the listener log has gone from 15 megs to 244 megabytes in the last 30 days. This is one, uh, one example. And the same thing is you purge with the dry run. It shows you it's going to free this much amount of space. And then you say, yep, I'm okay with this. And then I remove the minus dry run option and it's going to purge all these files in the destinations. So this is, these are options where you can automatically purge stuff without actually having to uh, uh, write, you know, requiring to actually do all this stuff manually. So I'll, I'll take two more questions and then it, I think I'm already over, so it's time to end this. Uh, is it possible to take advantage of Oracle Advanced Compression feature if enabled on a 12C X data system? Uh, yes, but again, this question is beyond the scope of troubleshooting. So I, I kind of give you that short answer. I think it's possible to do it. Uh, compression though, you there's already different kinds of compression enabled on an X data system. So you obviously want to make use of uh, HCC or those the hybrid columnar compression along with the, the, this default XCC that is actually applied on the X data cell side. So I, I think using advanced compression is probably going to be uh, limited because you already have some kind of compression that's also enabled on this X data. Could you share the slides? Yes. So I'm going to just keep this screen here for a second. Then you want to take a snapshot of this. The slides will be in the slide share that's actually here in this link. And they will also be uploaded to the OGB EMEA site uh, once I'm done with this presentation. And that's it, guys. I had a lot more, but of course, you know, time is always a constraint and tips are always cool. I will upload my presentation. So as you can see, I have 141 slides. So I covered probably about 70% of these, but there's a lot more tips inside that you can use to make your DBA lives way more efficient. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you guys have a good week.